Hey everyone, how you doing this morning? Very uh, interactive crowd. All right, so uh, I just, it's my first time with two microphones and four screens, as Todd <laughs> has said. Um, I'm gonna make this conversational and practical as possible for as many of you. This is a talk where, that I wish people had given to me when I started doing uh, social science with Python and R and other uh, languages that really allowed us allowed me to get out of the box and collect new data to inform uh, the social science research that we do at the Urban Institute, which I'll describe recent, um, soon. But essentially, this came about because when we have new hires at Urban and we're teaching them about you know the possibilities of how you can collect data from the web, often they see it as this great new tool that they can use to do anything with that's really exciting. And I do want them to see it that way because in, in my field at least, we are still at the beginning of taking advantage of some of the new tools offered that you guys probably already know of in data science that Python or R or other of these programming languages allow. You know, to give you an idea, a lot of our researchers, a lot of our staff at a research organization work with programming languages like Stata and SAS that are like these traditional statistical programming packages that allow you to work with this rectangular data set, and that's about it. And so we sort of want them to be excited about these new tools. On the other hand, there's a lot that they can do that will you know, get them into both legal trouble, could block our organization from having access to certain sites or services, and um, just a lot of trouble that they can get in personally that I want them to avoid. So I've made a lot of mistakes in web scraping. I've gotten in uh, a lot of trouble, both receiving legal notices, being threatened, receiving nasty emails, having to talk with lawyers. And so to the extent that you manage teams or you are part of a team that's taking advantage of web scraping, these are some practical tips that I have that I'd really like, wish that I had, knew, I had known uh, seven or eight years ago when I sort of started down this road. Um, and I hope that they're useful for you. And if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt throughout or we can take them at the end. So the flow of this talk is going to be, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Urban Institute because we're a little bit different than many of the other organizations presenting here. Um, sort of the power of web scraping and how we sort of talk about it at, uh, at Urban and in general, what it can do and what it can offer an organization. Some example projects that we've used web scraping with, um, just to give you a flavor for how we use it. Uh, some tools and tips for web scraping responsibly and doing it well. Some of these you may, may not surprise you. Others, I've had data scientists who have been working for years and said, oh man, I wish I'd known that trick. That's, that's pretty neat. Um, organizational policy. So we have set, we have set in stone, or not in stone, but we have set in a uh, box document, uh, the organizational policy for web scraping and the rules and, and checklists that people need to fill out just to make sure that they're following these, um, these uh, best practices. And uh, if it's helpful for you, I'm gonna show you, walk you through a little bit of our best practices for maybe they'll, they'll be useful for you or your organization. And then give you a little bit of my contact information, stay in touch, ask questions, learn more, et cetera. So about the Urban Institute, as I mentioned, we do social and economic policy research. We're about a 500 person organization. We're a nonprofit in DC. Um, and we have lots of different research centers doing work for both the federal government and for uh, private foundations on contracts. So we answer research questions that the federal government wants us to answer, that private foundations want us to answer about communities, about social policy. We have 10 or 11 centers now, I think it's 11. We just added our education policy center last week on education, health, housing, criminal justice, all these different policy issues. So I work daily with you know, criminologists, economics, PhDs, tax experts, people like that who are working to inform and as we call it, elevate the debate, right? So inject some, you know, for state, local and federal policymakers, inject some evidence into decision making. And so data science at Urban is a relatively recent addition, we've only been around for about four years. And this came about because of all these new tools and methodologies that are now available to help to inform social science that social scientists just don't know or aren't taking advantage of. So you know, you'll be amazed to know that you know, Stata and SAS, which are these statistical packages, are still the primary programming languages taught in these social science programs. And how do I know that? 
my background is in both economics and public policy. I am not a, a school trained data scientist. I started about eight years ago learning Python and R on my own and making all these mistakes on my own, as I had just told you. And so, you know, in these programs, it's sort of an afterthought how you, pro how you actually do the data analysis itself. We think a lot about, you know, economic theory, how that applies in practice, doing some basic data analysis on cleaned data sets, which is not the reality in 90% of these situations, and then you know, producing results, but no one's really trained in how to do that. So this data science concept is new. We're a team of about eight right now. We've doubled in the past year and a half in size, and we are supporting all of those research centers across the Urban Institute. So we are bringing new methodologies to social science, leveraging new architectures like Ty was talking about you know, on AWS, using Spark, using new, you know, bigger data systems, on-demand uh, elastic instances for researchers, but also introducing them to machine learning, into web scraping, into natural language processing, and how they can use that to analyze text data, to gather new data from the internet, right, to inform public policy. And so that's, that's my role at Urban, is to sort of be this you know, gatekeeper into this exciting data science world that you all are probably already familiar with. And so that's where my talk is really going to start here and where I, why I marked it as novice. And so I just want to get a little bit of a sense of the room to, so I can skip slides if necessary. So how many of you guys have been in data science or programmed in Python or R or any of the similar languages for the last like two or three years? Five plus years? Keep your hands up. OK, got it. So we have a few more senior people in the room. And then some people have been doing it for, for, for a couple of three years. That's, that's great. So, um, so I, I won't go over a lot about you know, what is web scraping. I think you guys are pretty familiar with it. This is the definition I came up with. And I, then I Googled it and found you know, three definitions that were really similar to mine. So I think this is generally what people would call web scraping, sort of automating this processing and collection of data from the web. right? Um, but why do you web scrape? You know, it's in one way, one thing we like to, to use it for, and especially in social science, is to gather new insights about data that we may not be able to access otherwise. So if there are data on, you know, my first web scraping project way back when was trying to figure out the quality scores for DC restaurants. Right? And DC has this, this great site that lists in like 7,000 links, and they have in each link you can click on it and you get like HTML reports of each restaurant's inspection rating, which is really hard to do comparisons across restaurants. So, you know, I web scraped that and got an idea of which one of my favorite restaurants were good on the inspection rating and which ones were bad. By the way, I wouldn't recommend doing that. It's not really that fun. Um, now Yelp has it, which is really a bummer to me because now I can see which restaurant I really like for years that is terrible. Um, but anyway, maybe that's a good thing. So new data, new insights, right? Real-time data is, is another advantage. So often in social sciences, and this may not be true in some places in private industry, but in social sciences, we have old data that is informing proactive policies in real time. And the problem with that is that we don't really know what's going on, for example, with gentrification. So, you know, Amazon HQ2 come into this area, right? Or a little bit close by. And we're trying to figure out, like, what are the impacts going to be on the region? The most recent neighborhood level data we have from the US Census is an average of 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016. Right? So an average of those five years is what we know about people's income and changes in you know, local housing conditions in a, in a, re, in a, in a way that we, that we really trust from a great government statistical agency. And so being able to scrape data on rents or get data on housing that in real time is a, is a huge advantage. And, and, we, and, we, and we really take advantage of it um, for informing policy proactively. And then last, it's save time and money, right? Because your alternative to web scraping is manually doing it yourself. <laughs> Right, which not only saves time and money, but also helps you retain good people who don't want to go manually through websites clicking every day. All right, so now I'm going to walk through a few example projects and get to the actionable tips. So um, the three examples I'm going to give are around one where we informed a study of the effects of criminal background checks on people's access to jobs in Washington, D.C. The second is where we took a data set on really granular data on jobs that's super useful, but no one uses in the research community because it's hard to access and centralize that in one big data set. And the third is you know, this, this common organizational problem of having lots of different systems internally that have useful information, but they're all separate. And so being able to collect all of that information within your organization and enable people to find it easily is, a, is another really good use case for web scraping. Um, so this first example on criminal ac background checks and access to jobs is that you know, it, when, you, when you get a criminal background check, 
what they're looking for is, what, is not whether you only had a conviction, but whether you have been brought to court. And so this is an important distinction because a lot of cases, we think, don't actually end in convictions, but then don't get wiped from the court records. So you could get rejected from a job, not because you've got a conviction on your record, but because you've been brought to court. You've been arrested for some reason, even if you were innocent, and that case just didn't get resolved in public records. Right? And this is a big problem, we think. Right? But we don't know because we don't have any active data on it, it turns out. And so we went to the DC Superior Court and said, hey, can we look into this problem? Uh, we'd love to you know, get access to that data and analyze it. And they said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't have access to that data. We don't want to allow you access to that data. And we said, man, that's a, that, that is a real bummer because we think this is a really interesting problem. It could be a huge problem for your residents. Uh, but it turns out the DC Superior Court had online an online search tool to look through their court records. So you could, look, you could put in your name, and, and specifically the first two letters of your last name and the first uh, letter of your first name was all that was required. And you could look up your, uh, your court record. And so by iterating through all possible combinations of your name, you can now extract all the million court records that we might need, in this case is a, a little over 100,000, um, that we might need to do this analysis. And you know, I'll talk a little bit about why I think that this was totally fine and responsible and good later. Um, but just know that this is a good example, and I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to it. And we used it to determine that about you know, 68,000 people were getting, and this is not the, the finding. I'm, I'm, uh, this is just some description of how we did it. Uh, and, we, and the number of cases collected, which is about 151,000. And we used that to say, OK, there are about, we, think, we think there are about 68,000 people of the population of DC, which is about 10% of the population of DC, that, that have a record in this database. And only half of them have a conviction. So that's about 34,000 people that could get caught in a criminal background check, even though they don't have a conviction. Right? And so this is a way of providing evidence to a, to a problem, to a real problem, and, and to put it in the, in the district's hands and say, hey, this is a really important issue for you to start cleaning up your data. So that's one example. A more mundane example is that this is a really useful data set if you, um, if you do any sort of economic analysis. Most people haven't heard of it. It's called the Longitudinal uh, employer, Di employer Household Dynamics Survey in the US Census. And basically, it takes state unemployment records and gives you, at a block level, there are 11 million blocks in the US. This is a really small geography. The number of jobs and the number of people with a job in that block. And it also gives you, for, a, for every pair of blocks in the US, the number of people that live in that block and commute to the other one. So it's a really useful data set on like, commuting patterns, where people live and work, how many jobs are, you know, job loss and gain over time in very specific geographic areas. But they release it in 75,503 gzipped CSV files, all with a drop-down selection there. There's no big single data set. Right? And this has been the biggest barrier to social scientists actually accessing this data. We have people that have been rerunning the wheel every time in urban, like just trying to access these data over and over and taking like a day to download and clean it and, and all of that. And so you know, one great use of web scraping is to write a Python program. In this case, we did this in AWS. We spun up a big server. We write a, wrote a Python program. And we downloaded and sent those files to um, uh, a central storage location, and then spun up a big data cluster using Spark, read them in, and wrote them out as one big data file. And so now everyone can access this data in one place, and it's really easy for people to centrally um, you know, analyze and access the data quickly, whether it's via a single machine using Python, or whether they want to use PySpark in a large cluster and analyze it more efficiently. So this is one example of you know, how do we get access? There's this, great, there's this barrier that the government won't put down, and we, we, need, we, we, we need to get past it. The third is streamlining internal search. So a couple of years ago, uh, I was going around and talking about the great uh, benefits of web scraping to people at Urban. And they said, you know what my real frustration is? This is great. You know, I, I get it that I can find these new data sources, but like, I can't find where the budget template is. 
in my organization, right? I like I have to know the right person in HR or in accounting or in this in this department to be able to find this resource. And they tell me, oh yeah, if you go to the internet and click on this one link, or if you go to this you know central resource and click on this one link, you'll you'll be able to find it, right? And this is because in our organization and many organizations of people I've talked to, there are different systems that are built at different times for different purposes by different departments and different people who may or may not still be in the organization. Right. And so one really useful part of web scraping is, you know, we have a system in box and we have our, you know, visual directory system where people sit in the building and there uh, another system with their contact information and their HR, you know, our HR system. And then we have our accounting system where all of our projects information resides. Right. And so all of these systems are separate and some of them are accessible via API and some of them are old and not. Right. Uh, and so Python can do a great job of, you know, if, for those of you familiar with web scraping, you can use you know, your, your standard request library to, do, to look at a standard web page. If, you, if, uh, if, if that won't work, you can use uh, Selenium and you can, you can automate a web driver and look at another web page. If that, do, if that doesn't work, then maybe that system has an API and you can interact with it. And Python can sort of do the job of collecting all the information from the system, centralizing it. In this case, we put it all in an Apache Solar instance, but you can put it in Elasticsearch or any sort of other uh, searchable database and basically enable you to put a search engine on top of all of that data on a regular basis. So you can automate that job put all the data in one place, allow it to be easily searchable. In this case, we have our new urban internal search as of two years ago that helps people find things better. So those are three like motivating examples. There are many more, obviously, in web scraping that you guys can think of. Uh, but I just want to give you a flavor for how we're using it at Urban. Right, so this talk is about web scraping responsibly. So the first question I get is, why web scrape responsibly? Right? What, why wouldn't I just web scrape? Uh, <laughs> I, I seriously get that question a lot, right? Because if you, until you actually know what the dangers are, you really don't know what you're getting into. And so um, I really just love, I love to start with horror stories because I feel like people connect with them more quickly and hopefully uh, it helps them learn from my mistakes. You know, some people need to make their own. That's great. I like to try to lay them all out just in case you'd like to learn from mine. Um, so, you know, I, I, have an, I have a few cases where I've gotten our organization blocked from accessing the census's website for a week. It's a big problem for a social and economic research organization not to have access to census data. There are other sites where you can get it, it turns out, and we have lots of friends. So it ended up being okay. I got in a bit of trouble. Um, I've gotten uh, a couple of uh, legal notices served to me, uh, threatening very large fines, uh, which were larger than my account balance right after grad school, I want to point out, which was negative. So uh, <laughs> I was a little bit concerned with those. Turned out, uh, after working with our lawyers, everything was fine, and talking to our project representatives at those organizations, everything was fine. Um, uh, I have also uh, gotten an gotten, uh, organization blocked from Google Scholar, which is a fairly useful site for those of you who know. It does help you search uh, all scientific publications. Um, it wasn't me who actually got everyone blocked from Google Scholar on AWS. Everyone's just blocked on AWS from Google Scholar now. Apparently a lot of people had that same idea to scrape Google Scholar and Google Scholar just blocks all AWS IPs right now. Um, but you know, you can get your organization blocked, you can get in trouble, you can get in legal trouble. There are real fines that are associated with it. I just talked to someone a couple weeks ago, just total coincidence while putting together this talk. Um, uh, anonymous person I will not name at the University of Chicago who is scraping data from a uh, Florida state website. And I didn't know this, but it turns out in the state of Florida, it is a felony to block access or do uh, in some way to a state website that is needed, and in this case it was a court website, that is needed for access by the public. And so he was going through quite a, a bit of legal trouble with the university and the state of Florida trying to get his name cleared for web scraping. So I, I mention these because uh, I, I want to get out to the, the seriousness of the actual trouble you can get into, both you know, blocking things for your organization, which isn't legal, but just really inconvenience people and make them mad at you. And then there's the legal aspect. And then there's another reason, which is that you should try to be a nice person when you're doing these things. Now you have this great power. Um, you should be cognizant of some of the side effects that you might have on the organizations you're scraping, your organization, uh, and things like that. 
But I hope this, the scary part works the best. Uh, and anyway, it has for the people that I train uh, at Urban. And they haven't left yet. So tools and tips. So things I wish people had told me, that was the real purpose of this talk. I think some of them you'll already know. Hopefully some of them you'll take away and will be interesting to you. Um, my hope is that you take at least one of these away and say, huh, I'll, I might use that on my next web scraping project. So here are some responsible questions that I tell people to ask. And in fact, I'll tell you later that some of these are in our guidelines specifically in our checklist before web scraping. So is my web scraper affecting site latency? Right? And site latency means how long it takes when I make a request to that website, when I type that website's name into a browser, when I make a request in Python somehow with URL live, with requests, with whatever I'm using, how long does it take for that site to come back? Uh, before I'm actually actively scraping it and when I'm actually actively scraping it, am I really affecting that time that it takes to get back, right? If it, if it was taking, if it was instantaneously delivering a web page to a user before I web scraped it and now it takes it a minute, that's a problem, right? You are, you are affecting other people who are trying to access that site, you're affecting that business, you're affecting that public organization, wherever you're scraping from. So is my web scraper affecting site latency? So if the site had my name and email, if they knew who I was, Right? Would I still scrape from the website? This shouldn't stop you necessarily, but it should make you think. Right? Are you actively, if, if they knew who you were, would you think, would you think again? So another question is, you know, how can I minimize the number and rate of requests? So this goes back to uh, site latency, right? So even if you don't think you're going to be affecting site latency, still think a little bit about, you know, how can I make fewer requests? Do I really need it in that amount of time? Um, do I need to really make that many at the same time? Things like that. Um, and sort of what are the consequences if I block access for my organization, for me, for my organization, for other folks? This one's pretty straightforward. And then, you know, what have, others do, what have others I know done to web scrape responsibly, right? This talk is only a subset of all the things that you can do to check to scrape responsibly. I'm going to show you a couple other resources you can check out. I encourage you to share resources within your organization so that other, you can learn from others. Um, but this is just a subset of the things you can learn. Um, so is my web scraper affecting site latency? So this is a tool called Site Monitor that we built. It's public on GitHub. Um, and our, on our uh, public GitHub account, Urban Institute. Um, so you can just Google Urban Institute Site Monitor or you can take a picture or copy that site. Uh, essentially what it does is it's um, an add-on to the Python's request library that monitors the latency of a website, monitors how long it takes that site to respond. It does a couple smart things. One thing it does is it has a burn-in period. You can set that burn-in period. Here it's 100 seconds. That burn-in period essentially is a period where you're just sending it, you're sending the site some random or just their first 100 or first 700, whatever it is, end result, end request to the site, and it's measuring the response time of the site, and it's saying, okay, you know, sometimes it's it's 100 milliseconds, sometimes it's a second. That's not really related to me because I'm doing just some random non non difficult request to the site, and then once that burn-in period ends, which is that vertical line, uh, that vert vertical uh, dash line then it actually starts scraping and continuously measures that response time. If after that burn-in period, that red line is exceeded by our web scraper, then it'll say, huh, maybe I'm affecting the latency of the site. Maybe. It could be that other people are also web scraping the site or that a lot of people are hitting it all at once now. So I'm going to take a step back. So instead of scraping with no delay, now I'm going to scrape with a second delay between every request. And then if that's still above the red line, it'll say, I'll take another step back to two seconds. And then we take a step back, and you can set this number to any number you want. We set it to 30. After a 30-second delay between requests, we're pretty sure it's not us anymore. So we let the web scraper run. So this is just our way of implementing it. You can set these constants in any way you want through this package. But it's one way of measuring. You can, you can take a look at the graphs, or you can let the program do it yourself, of measuring the latency of the site requests as you're web scraping. This works on top of requests, so it doesn't work on top of you know, packages you might use like Selenium, but I think it's a, you know, we, 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 we use requests because it's the most common library we use for web scraping. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is, there, is there a particular uh, time of day that you find is the best? Like, do you try to do it at night so that it's, it has uh, like less of an impact or you know that it's probably not going to have an impact? Yes, we do. I'm actually going to, you are a plant. Um, no, you're not. I'm sorry. But yeah, that's actually two slides ahead. So I will get to that. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Um, so that's site monitor. Uh, the second is, you know, would I scrape if, if they still knew it was me? So the way we do this and the way a lot of people recommend it, this isn't our original idea, is that 
in requests, you can send a header. And that header gets recorded by the web server. And in it, you can add a user agent into your dictionary that says, hey, I'm the Urban Institute. This is a research data collector, and here's my email. In this case, um, one of our programmers, Jeff Levy, wrote this web scraper. So um, Jeff, do Jeff doesn't mind. He's the one who wrote our site monitor package as well. So if you really want to email him, you can. But you know, <laughs> please don't without asking me first. Um, so anyway, so there's Urban Institute site monitor. There's Jeff, right? He's like, I'm being nice. I'm sending my email out to. Uh, to this organization. In this case, it's DC Quartz, as you can tell. Uh, we have the host is dcquartz.gov. And when we make this request, whether it be post or get, then they'll know it's us. And if they want to contact us or they have any problems with it, they can get in touch. Uh, how can I minimize the burden on the site? So a lot of people, the first, the first thing they do when they're, getting a web, when they're using a web scraper and it takes hours is, man, maybe I can parallelize this somehow. Let me use multiprocessing. And I can you know, use my local computer that has four cores or eight cores. I can use an AWS computer that has 128 cores. I can, hit, I can really hit this site and download it. Right? So this is how I got blocked from census for a week, by the way. I was like, uh, I, I, this is really smart. I know multiprocessing. I know requests. I can just parallelize this. And I'll download 128 files at the same time. Right? So the first thing to think about is, that, is that really necessary? Can you just wait a day? Can you wait an hour? Is that you really need that data right now? Uh, the second is like you know census is is accessed much more during the day than at night, um, and you know you usually know your site and whether it has that level of traffic during day or night. If not, you can use site monitor to your question and see whether or not that level of traffic changes at any, at any point in time. But um, typically, we like to run these things at night. So for the DC Quartz web scraper, it took I think it took uh, almost a day, and so we ran it in two iterations: one 12 hour at night uh, after people went home, the next the next day, right? And so you can sort of vary it however you want, but you know, if you really don't need it that hour, that minute, then I would recommend doing a single core, not parallelizing, and then running it uh, at night if you can. And then, you know, are multiple pages contained in a single file? So this is something that, uh, a trick that I, I know a few people know, but I, I, I wish no, more people knew. And this is that, um, you know, when you're scraping a website, often you might have multiple pages that all have different values on them. But it turns out when you look at the underlying JavaScript of the site, it is pulling from one file, one JSON file, one CSV file, one TSV file, whatever the web developer put that format in. And one way to find out whether or not that site is pulling data from a central file is, I mean, I use Chrome a lot, and you can use, do this in other browsers, but you go to the developer console, so that's right click inspect. For those of you familiar, the F12 shortcut on a keyboard. Um, you can go to like help and, and, and go to your, uh, your console. And essentially, in this console, you'll see a network tab. And that network tab, uh, once you click it, we'll, um, every web request that comes in will be recorded in that network tab. Most often on newspapers, you'll see this as like click tracking that they're doing on you. You'll see every request it makes to the advertiser's site to get more advertising and provide information about how you're browsing that page. So you'll see all that activity come on once you click that. You need to refresh the page first, so it'll start over and grab the first file, and grab all of the files, actually, for that website. And you can see all the files that are being grabbed by the website. Normally, there are like hundreds of files. So what I would do is click on the XHR J or JavaScript tab, which will get you the primary data files that are being pulled by that website. And so in this list, this is an example of an Urban Institute interactive feature built by our web team, where we have lots of different pages on a website. And uh, you can see in that lower left, if you can read it, there's CSV, TSV files, and a JSON file. And those are all the data that's powering all of those different pages. So instead of hitting the site hundreds of times, getting each data point from each different page, you could go to the, you know, in, go to the console, go to the um, developer tools, go to the network tab, refresh the page, and try to find those files. And you can just get the URL for them and download them directly. You don't even need to build a web scraper. Right, so that's a that's a that's a good trick for trying to figure out: Do I really need to hit this page that many times? Um, okay, so now the you know more serious stuff. What are the consequences of getting blocked? I already mentioned some of these: fines, lawsuit, jail. Uh, don't need to mention them again. Um, organization or community access gets blocked. Again, don't need to mention these again. These can be big negative consequences. Uh, here's what Google Scholar looks like from AWS. This is the message I got as well um, when I was trying to automate it from our organization. Uh, we're sorry, but your computer may be sending automated queries to protect our users. You are now blocked. Uh, this is actually less scary than getting a legal notice, but still uh, not very fun. 
Um, and then what have others uh, done to web scrape responsibly? So I would look up uh, the post, a post called Ethics and Web Scraping on Towards Data Science. I would look at how to crawl the web politely on Scraping Hub. There are lots of these resources out there. Um, and also share your code. So you know, internally, I can't share this uh, externally because there's um, some proprietary data in this uh, repo. But we do have a lot of web scraping projects that we do internally. Uh, and the, those projects we share throughout our organization so that other people can just grab, drag and drop our code. You know, that way, when they start with our code or with our, you know, with our other web scraping projects and start with the basics, then there are those time delays built in, right? There are those calls to site monitor already built in. And so they start with, from a better point of web scraping than just look, Googling online, seeing how request works and running their site without really thinking through the consequences of web scraping. So I would encourage you guys to either set that up for your teams or to encourage your teams to share their web scraping code. So then I'll turn to the last part, uh, which is a little bit boring, but I find really important um, to keep people out of trouble, keep our organization out of trouble from a leadership standpoint, uh, is our organizational policy. So I have to put this on here, blah, blah, blah. You have time to read this. I'm not a lawyer. That should be obvious to you by now, given how much trouble I got into. <laughs> All right, so approval for web scraping projects. So all projects are approved by the data science team. There aren't a ton, so this isn't a big, um, a big lift on, on me or my team. Uh, and they should meet the guidelines expressed in our organizational policy. So here are some good general guidelines. I can't share with you our web scraping guidelines due to legal restrictions. I can give you the general outline of them, so I hope this is helpful. Are you scraping a private company or a public entity? So there's a little bit of a difference in the law here. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but having talked to many lawyers and gotten in a lot of trouble, I know general guidelines for differences. Private company or public entity is important. Public companies, general, private entities um, generally have a copyright on their web pages. And that copyright law is in a gray area right now. So it is not black and white as in this is bad, you will get in trouble. However, they can send you threatening legal notices that you may, not, you may not know how to combat or that may drag you into court, which is not a good thing. Um, there's been a couple cases, one four years ago with Craigslist, in which Craigslist won a case uh, of a web scraper, uh, a web scraping company that was trying to collect all of their data and sell it for commercial purposes. Um, there is also a case last year with LinkedIn in which Lin LinkedIn lost at the lower court level. People who are saying LinkedIn data is public. We, can, we, have the, we have the right to scrape it. Uh, and so it's currently a little bit of a gray area in terms of whether or not this is legal or not. But you generally, generally speaking, public entities have a mission to make data public. And therefore, you, don't, you, don't, you tend not to have that legal gray area with public companies where you do it with the private, cop, private copyright law of private companies. So the first thing we usually do is, you know, whether it's a public or private entity, just try to contact the site owner or the data owner first, right? Just get in touch with them. Often they'll, they'll be really nice and provide it to you. Sometimes they'll be like the DC courts and say, no, we don't want to give you your data, right? But oftentimes we've found that people just give us the data and it's, a little, and it's easier and just as fast as doing a web scraper. Um, you know, purpose, commercial or non-commercial. Most of the trouble that people have gotten are reselling the data or using web scraping as a tool for making profit for commercial purposes. So these are many of the big lawsuits that we've seen. You know, I talk to a lot of reporters that have, you know, and data journalism is this growing field that are doing web scraping, and they mostly don't get in trouble for this. You know, a lot of sting pieces on Airbnb, for example, right, where people scrape Airbnb's data. Technically, Airbnb could take them to court. I've talked to a bunch of reporters um, when I was trying to figure out, like, well, is that legal? What can we do? And they said, you know, we've never gotten in trouble for them. They know that it's going to look bad for them publicly to, to sue a reporter for the data. They're trying, to, they're trying to be good citizens. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but um, they're trying to be good citizens. And, you know, they don't, they, they don't, they don't want to be seen in that negative light. So, you know, purpose, commercial versus non-commercial makes a big difference. Um, volume and effect in site operations, obviously. Um, I think that should be effect, oh well. Uh, volume and effect on site operations is important. You want to make sure that you're just minimizing volume as much as possible. So when we talk through people, uh, people's projects for approval, we say, you know, what, what, ways you, what, what steps are you taking to minimize burden on the site? Um, and then lastly, always look at the terms of services and the robots.txt file of the site. So just Google the site or site insight search terms of service. Try to read through them. If they explicitly ban web scraping, then you're probably not being a good citizen by web scraping their site. 
Uh, also, similarly, if you go to the root uh, domain of the website, so google.com slash robots.txt, you know, urban.org slash robots.txt, whatever that site is, um, just take a look at that robots.txt file. It'll list all of the areas of the site that they don't want automated scrapers to collect from. Um, so generally, two useful places to search, terms of service, robots.txt. So when we were doing the DC Quartz project, we looked at both their robots.txt and their terms of service. None of them forbid automated web scraping. DC Quartz is a public domain, is a public organization. We were collecting it for non-commercial research purposes, and we used Site Monitor to ensure that we were not negatively affecting their volume, right, of their traffic going to the site. People could still search DC Quartz site. It would still take them 30 seconds to get back a response from the site. The site is really slow. So uh, we were not materially affecting the response time of DC Quartz. So that's sort of the, the example I give as, you know, we went through all of these steps. We tried to contact them, there, but they said no. They were a public entity. It was non-commercial, no effect on operations. Check their terms of service robots.txt. Everything was fine. We said go. We can go scrape them. Uh, why these uh, guidelines? So I just explained a little bit about it. Um, you know, public sites are public domain, but still check the terms of service in robots.txt to be nice. Um, the largest legal cases primarily concern commercial scraping of private websites that I've seen. There are a few minor exceptions to that, but this is where most of the trouble has come. Um, negatively affecting access to a site, in my view, is always bad, so never do it, even, even if you're outside of Florida, <laughs> right? Uh, I, would still do, I would still say negative affecting sites is, is always bad. It may not be a felony, but it's always bad. Um, and site owners will sometimes provide data on request if you ask nicely. So that's it for my talk today. Uh, we talk a lot about how we use data science to elevate the debate around social and economic policy on data at Urban. It's our blog on Medium. We talk about all kinds of cool stuff that are not in this talk, like how to set up automated big data services in AWS and things like that. Uh, so you can check us out there. I'm also on Twitter at uh, Graham I Mac. Um, and it's not because I have a Mac. It's because Graham I MacDonald was taken, and that's my full name. Um, and so get in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk more, talk about other data science stuff. Um, but otherwise, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. We have a couple of minutes for questions. OK. Great. Yeah, questions. if anyone has any questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, hi, so you spoke about this being just a subset of the different ways that you can uh, check to make sure you're scraping responsibly. And one subset that you didn't really touch on very much is when you're scraping data that is personal data and your scraping might result in greater exposure of that data. So I was wondering if you have any methodologies or tips or tools surrounding that subset of problems. Yeah, that is a, that's a real tricky issue. So I will tell you, with the DC Quartz website, we didn't originally think it was sensitive data that we were collecting. We have, um, in our organization, we have an internal uh, review board process for research, which means we have to pass everything through an internal review board. During that work, we always manually check the results of our scraping data. So looking at data, as you guys all know, always the first line of defense. Immediately, we saw that on accident, some of the DC Quartz records had addresses and social security numbers of people publicly listed. So we went back to our IRB and said, we didn't think this was an IRB issue. It is an IRB issue. This is private and this is private data. So I think one thing to, I think that's a big issue. One thing to do is always to make sure you check your data. There are a number of different ways to do that. We ended up writing um, a bunch of different NLP and regular expression parsers to ensure that all the data we collected was immediately stripped out and we notified DC courts. Um, but I, there's a lot of different cases where that could be true. and I. I think it was, in this case, I, I think checking the data yourself is always the first line of defense. Yep, go ahead. Um, this is particularly around like, public institutions, but have you noticed like, over the past eight years that there's been more of a push towards open data because of the prevalence of public scraping? Um, I used to work for the DC Police Department, and mm. they were are recently having this big push toward open data just because like, a lot of it is available on the site, just like not all at once, but we know that people can access it. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really good question. And I want to say that DC Police Department was much better than DC Courts and was usually provided us with data where we asked. So that was very, uh, kudos. Yeah, see, you know. <laughs> we are, I didn't want to, yeah, anyway, this is on video, so I won't say anything. But, um, <laughs> right, so the question was, have you seen a push toward open data because of web scraping? Yes and no. So I, I do think that there is, a, there is a point there where people have been opening up data sets because 
you know, they've seen that there, it, there has been some activity from like, people like me and people who code from DC and other organizations, that, you know, Data Science DC and others. I, I, I also think, you know, I found this in my organization and in DC uh, as well, where the biggest pushes come from within government sometimes, where the government really wants to know what another agency has, and another agency won't share it from them, as you just said. And so I think, I think yes, there is some push from, the web, from web scraping, but I think more so it's a push of, oh, I didn't even know this other agency within government had this data. Isn't this awesome? The number one user of a lot of these data pours is, is internal government agencies in different departments. So I do think that's a part, but not the biggest part. Yep, one more. Do you do primary data collection through surveys or things like that? Yes. So do you treat the data that you web scrape with the same sort of privacy protections that you do those data that you do primary collection? So it depends on, the, again, uh, related to the IRB process, uh, depends on the type of data we're collecting. In this case, yes, we did as we went through that IRB process, so we treated it in the same way. Depends on the sensitivity of the data. We always write a different IRB plan for a different data. So you know you have to have data security, data con confidentiality. But we have templates that we use and we start from, and largely, yes. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Chris.